First question is from Rumination, and Rumination asks, how do I best support Ukraine if I loathe US imperialism? What I'm doing today is jumping into the YouTube Studio app and searching comments on the chat channel sorted by question mark, simply because I didn't pre-select for health reasons questions today. Um, but this could actually be interesting. So let's see how we go. Um, well, Rumination, how do you support Ukraine if you loathe US imperialism? Now, I'm not going to debate whether the United States is an empire or not on this occasion and evaluate what kind of an empire it is. But if you have an allergic reaction, then I can't help you. And of course, either way, you need to answer this question for yourself. I can't hand anything to you on the plate. But if you have an effective idea about how you want to balance this, then I'd say this, look, in the 1990s, when there was an enormous degree of optimism about global justice in the West, there was a great deal of talk in the journalistic circles, in the academy, about humanitarian intervention. And a very common view was that Humanitarian intervention is a normatively impeccable enterprise, but it can never be done well in practice. And I want to say that that's the right position. I just want to say that that's a compelling starting point, a compelling thought with which to begin. Um, and so what does that mean? Well, it means that you're not going to get anything that doesn't appear grey, messy, compromised, unless you have a global government. And you ain't going to have a global government with human beings living under very different cultural conditions, being run by very different kind of polities, polities that are plural, polities that contain a great deal of conflict within them and between them. So there isn't going to be anything clean that you can touch in foreign affairs unless you have a kind of benign global government. So everything is going to be a matter of engaged, practical judgment that's not going to survive a kind of um, aesthetic or identitarian or expressive aversion to partly compromising yourself. So that's one thing I'd say. Um, let me tell you that there's a human error that humans have always made. And Aristotle picks up on it in the Nicomachean Ethics when he talks about Plato's form of the good. And he says, look, a white thing isn't any more white if it's white for a single day than if it were white for an eternity. So just because we may need to reject a maximalist version of a certain idea does not mean that idea dies in more um, modest, more resolutely modest forms. So it's very important to um, not jump from the idea that a certain kind of political formation does bad things to the idea that it, it can never be supported. Um, so this is very, very important to not have this all or nothing approach. And beyond this, I would say be careful with causes. You know, don't end up saying daft stuff, which I'm not saying you're saying, like the US support of Ukraine is, is, is a product of nothing more than the interests of the military industrial complex. That's, these kinds of claims um, need to be sustained causally and that they're, they're cheap to make and they have a place, but it's important that that place is taken seriously. Now, Google Day asks, does, since this is another philosophical question, I'm going to be brief for now. Google Day asks, does presenting a coherent alternative vision of what you want to happen give the best chance, give you the best chance of getting others to adopt that vision? I'm thinking about, um, the uh, recent climate action of just stop oil, but I'm also thinking of the extraordinarily unproductive, you know, methods of violence, intimidation that Russia is using in Ukraine. Surely met methods like that can't work. So I'm just wondering um, what methods are most effective for persuasion. 
the methods that are most effective for persuasion um, depend on what kind of political and cultural context you're in. So let me give you an example. If in the UK today, the government comes after me and I have a truthful and sound argument about why they're mistaken, I have a pretty good chance of standing my ground successfully. So that's to say that I'm in a particular culture where the odds that a truthful position will win are not incredibly great, but they're pretty good. In Russia, if I am taking a truthful and valid position against the Putin regime, the regime is going to come after me anyway. In fact, it's going to especially come after me. So when somebody comes and knocks on the professor's door, smashes the professor's um, spectacles, a professor's claim to truth here is going to only have weight in very particular and relatively privileged cultural circumstances. So what's the philosophical consequence of this? Well, that an argument that's a good argument is better than a bad argument, but only as far as arguments go. And very often it's not arguments that persuade people. There's a lot more to say about this and we will talk about this, but I think this is, this is just a tiny snippet to give now. Um, Sophie and me asks, are the Russian people colonized or did they self-colonize? I have a problem with shifting a narrative away from repressive, a repressive totalitarian regime that impacts its own populace onto explanations that are about external forces. Sure, a pedantic argument could be made for internal colonization, but that relies on the denial of agency of the Russian people. Russia has two complexes, two conditions. One is an imperial condition that we talked about many times. The other is a condition that you associate with colonized populations. And that's one of the themes of the work of Vyacheslav Morozov, who I was talking about um, on the last video. And the argument there is that, look, we've got to look carefully about where this sort of feeling comes from in Russians, that they're second rate, that they need to assert themselves, they need to prove that they're really the equal of you know, other cultures and other polities in the world. And Morozov says that there are some interesting senses in which what's effectively happened in Russia is that Russian elites have colonized the Russian population in a way that is non-trivially analogous to how co colonial enterprises have worked elsewhere. And he tries to give that substance. I don't encourage uh, accepting his arguments or his methodology, but I, I do think that um, where he takes this is essential and absolutely illuminating and worth discussing more. Um, Vlad, what was that at 3.12? The pleasure of doing bad things. Your left eye. Look at yourself. <laughs> what did you mean? Are you a closet um, evil? Are you closet evil or close to thespians? Building a character, all that racket. Should I fear you? Um, okay. So what happened in the last video is that I probably went like that when I and I, I've gone like that every time I've talked about the joy of doing evil and I've talked about that symbol Z. So no, that's not somebody below is saying that that's because I'm not I've got a health condition. No, it's nothing to do with my health condition. It's that um, it's very important to not think that bad people are unhappy. Yeah, <laughs> it's very important to understand that humans have destructive energies, destructive capabilities that are just as real as their creative capabilities. And 
what that means is that it's a terrible mistake. Here are some people to say, here are some people doing bad things, and that's because they're trying to be good but failing. So this is the sort of thing that Lex Friedman loves to say on his podcast about Vladimir Putin, that, or at least imply that Vladimir Putin is trying his best for his country, but it's just failing very badly. I think that's an elementary misunderstanding, not just of Putin, but of um, human psychology. Um, and no, I'm not going to stick that into Lex because I haven't watched enough of, it, of, of what he said. So that, that's just a snippet observation. I'm not making a deep objection to him. C.B. Johnson. What can we learn from the great 19th century Russian writers about Russia today? If you're talking about the politics, then my, my instinct is to say nothing. And to... I mean, it's much more complex than that, but in a cartoonish sense, nothing. Because it's very important that we um, reduce the degree to which we take Putin seriously when he quotes 19th century Russian writers. Uh, we shouldn't. There's a completely exploitative political technology relation. There's so much more to say. I appreciate about your important question. I hope to deal with it. Do you have any hope for Russia's future? Yes, of course. Um, there is hope for Russia's future, even if the Russian state disintegrates. Um, because we wouldn't just then have hope for biological human units living on that territory. There'd also be hope for the polities that arise in it. But um, you don't give up hope unless you lo lose the possibility to think that there is a there is hope that there will be hope in the future yeah so when you've really lost is when you no longer hope that there could be hope in the future um, it's not a completely hopeless state if there is no hope now it's a hopeless state if you know there couldn't be hope in the future um that's a philosophical meditation. But rough, roughly speaking, um, uh, Russia's future is highly, highly uncertain. Um, could you please do an episode devoted to nihilism, um, which seems to be an important character of Putin's regime? So I am planning to talk to you about something like that indirectly in the next video on the main channel totally tangential tangential um dina asks and that was janice before talking about nihilism dina asks what's your gear um sm7b that's not working properly with a cloud lifter and an hs6 thingy um hs6 zoom whatever it's called a uh, prigozhin flywheeler 56 asks um what about Prigozhin's outsized influence? Is it driving Russia's foreign policy under Putin? Could you speak about this in the context of Machiavelli's warning against relying on mercenary commanders? Putin is dismantling the Russian state that he shaped little by little. And that includes uh, beginning to dismantle the state's monopoly over organized violence. Mm. That's extraordinary. Um, however, Prigozhin wants to sit at an improved table to the table at which he sits. And he wants people to say, look, I've done a lot of dirty stuff. That doesn't mean I shouldn't be sitting at the table with you, because part of the point here is that it's your dirty stuff that I've been working on. So I need an elevated uh, seat at the table here, but that's not to do with wanting to run Russia and be a president. Why don't you speak more about Andrei Tarkovsky? Because we're not talking about art and film. Andrei Tarkovsky is Russia's greatest film director. If you look at people who worked since the Second World War, together with Ingmar Bergman and with Louis Buñuel, um, Tarkovsky shows the greatest capacity for control in the transference of a psychological state onto the canvas of a film shot, film scene. Are there some objections to Tarkovsky? Are there imperfections in Tarkovsky's approach that are structural and to do with his fancy of French intellectualism? Yes. 
He's director of Genius, though. Thank you for another great question, Q&A. Um, I can't see Ukraine giving up anytime soon. So how do you think Putin could ever win? Um, Ukraine isn't going to give up um, because it is the victim of uh, an invasion that is um, terroristic and underpinned by genocidal discourse. Now, that doesn't mean that we stably know at what point the war stops. Vlad, are you still posting videos in the main channel? Ty Select asks, yes, the main channel is actually my priority, not, not the chat channel. Um, but um, it takes a lot less to talk with you casually here and a lot more to make a video in the main channel, partly because of the way YouTube works. And my health has been poor recently. I've been working with about two hours a day and only the majority, but not all of that can be dedicated to YouTube. So I'm working on my health and working on sustainability. And I'm hoping to begin a video, making a video for the main channel tomorrow. And melancholy that a month has passed since we've done one. Um, but I'm, I'm obviously thrilled about what, what we're going to talk about next. Let's love.